Hello everyone, this is Ahmed Lali, a PhD candidate in Structural Engineering from the University of Leeds. I would like to welcome you all to my presentation of my conference paper with the title Flexural Behavior of Prefabricated Ultra Shallow Steel Concrete Composite Slabs. I worked on this paper in cooperation with Dr. Constantinus from the University of Leeds. As an introduction to the topic of the paper, let me start by talking about why steel concrete composite structural systems became an important subject of research. That is due to their efficiency in material usage and cost reduction, as well as their ability to offer high strength. Steel concrete composite flooring systems are one of the most commonly used STC structural elements, and their evolution over the previous decades led to improving the quality of the flooring systems and achieving slim floors. As we can see in the pictures here, this is a downstand beam with composite slab with metal decking, which is one of the first applications of steel concrete composite floors. The evolution of SCC flooring systems allowed us to produce slim floors where slab's thickness is integrated within the depth of the composite beams. As we can see in the pictures here, some examples of composite beam with hollow core units, composite beam with uh, composite slab with metal decking, and composite beam with cofradial composite slab. Not only these are the advantages, but the optimized material and energy consumption, as well as the efficient design of structural flooring systems, can help us in achieving sustainability goals and protecting the planet. Prefabricated ultra shallow slabs, also known as PUS, is the subject of this paper, and it is a recently developed ultra shallow and lightweight composite flooring system that was first introduced in 2017. As we can see in the drawings, PUS units can be placed beside each other within the depth of the steel beams to form a composite slim floor beam, as an example. Casting concrete on site with the addition of the required shear connections as we can see in this picture, will develop the composite action in beams. The standard post-modular units has a shallow depth of 230 mm and a relatively large unit width of 2 m. It is composed of ribbed reinforced concrete slab that is encased within two C-channel parallel flange steel beams, as we can see in the schematic drawing of a segment of the slab here. This is the ribbed concrete slab, and these are the two side steel beams. These steel beams and the concrete are connected to each other with one of three novel horizontal shear connection systems, which composed of either a horizontal web welded shear studs, also known as WWSS, horizontal steel dowels welded to the webs, or a combination of WWSS with steel dowels. Here in the schematic drawing, we can see the combination of WWSS and steel dowels. And in these two sketches, we can see a sketch of a section in the longitudinal direction, cutting the ribs, showing the rib sizes and reinforcement details, and a sketch of a section through the width of the slab. The previous research on POS demonstrated some advantages of the POS flooring system, such as the quick and efficient off-site production, the potential to develop high strength and sustainable lightweight slim flooring systems, as well as the significant reduction in energy consumption, global warming potential, time and cost in comparison to the widely used holocore precast slabs and the cofradal slabs. In addition, the behavior of the shear connection systems implemented in POS were previously investigated experimentally under the push-out test along with finite element parametric study and as a result the following formula for calculating the shear resistance of the shear connection systems was developed, which is a function of the compressive strength of concrete, the size and location of the studs or dowels, and the tensile strength of studs or dowels. Since the experimental four-point pending tests on POS were delayed due to the lab closure because of COVID, the finite element modeling approach was validated against an experimental four-point pending test from literature. For more details, you can refer to the paper. Let me now go fast over the modeling approach. Because of symmetry and to save computational time, only one half of the specimen was modeled. To model the steel components properties, trilinear stress-strain curve was used and stress triaxiality to model the ductile damage of the shear connectors. 
to model the concrete properties, the constitutive law of your code 2 with concrete damage plasticity model and exponential tension softening model was used. Hard contact between concrete and steel beams and shear connectors, embedded steel reinforcement in concrete, and proper element types were assigned to different parts of the model, and a manual mapped meshing was used to get smaller meshes near the shear connectors. As we can clearly see in these figures, the finite element model results gave good agreement with the experimental. Here is a comparison of the resulted mid-span deflection and longitudinal strain in bottom steel blade versus the maximum moment curves, as well as a visual comparison of end slabs and cracks developments. In this research, a finite element parametric study is presented with 18 models that explore the flexural behavior of web-welded shear stats and horizontal steel dowels shear connections and post units. The effect of three main variable parameters were included in the study. The first is the shear connection system, which is either web-welded shear stats with steel dowels (SD models) or only steel dowels (D models) or only WWSS. S models. The second parameter is the size of the shear connectors for each shear connection system. Three different sizes in the range between 22 and 16 mm in diameter were used. This gave us a total of nine models. This number is multiplied by two because the last parameter studies the effect of the location of the main pressure caused by the loading, which was taken to be either on the side steel beams or on concrete along the center line of the slabs. For this parameter, suffix C or S is added to the name of the model. It is important to mention that all the models had at least the double amount of shear connections required to provide full degree of shear connection. The geometrical shape and size of all the developed models were kept identical with 230 mm depth, 2 meter width, and 6 meter clear span between supports. Also, similar materials properties were applied in all the models. In this slide, we can see a sketch of a 2D side view of the four-point bending test that the finite element model simulates with 6 meter clear span and 1.5 meter between the loading points. In addition, this is a capture of the parts involved in the models before and after assembly. We can see the steel beam, shear connectors, steel reinforcements, and concrete slab. Also, this is a capture of the meshing of the slab showing mapped smaller meshes in the area around the shear connectors. Finally, and most importantly, here is a capture that clarifies the differences between the main pressure locations of the load line loads, which is one of the parameters of the study, to be mainly on the side steel beams or in the center line of concrete. Now let's have a discussion on the results of the parametric study, starting with the mid-span deflections versus the maximum moment curves of all the models. It can be clearly seen that all the models had similar performance in elastic region, up to around 40 mm mid-span deflections. After that, we start to see the differences between the models. It was interestingly found that all the models with the load applied mainly on steel beams had almost the exact same behavior with only small differences. Therefore, and to make the curves clear, all of them are represented with a single blue line in the graph. We can see from that line that these slabs started yielding very close to reaching the hand calculated ultimate moment capacity of the slabs, which was found to be around 460 kN. This was not the case when the load pressure was carried mainly by concrete, as seen in these lines. Models with WWS only, which is the gray line, had much lower moments compared to the other models. Models with steel dowels only had performances and curves much closer to the models of loads applied mainly on steel. This is because dowels acted as additional beam reinforcements and provided better bond between concrete and steel beams. It can also be seen from the green, black, and red lines that there is a direct proportion pattern between the sizes of the shear connectors and the moment capacity of the slabs. Finally, the addition of WWSS to the steel dowels had a negligible effect, and therefore they are presented with the same curves lines of models with dowels only.
Now let's have a look on the end slip versus maximum moment curves derived from the models. Models with loads applied mainly on concrete and those with loads applied mainly on steel beams had almost similar curves and therefore here we are presenting only the case of load carried mainly by concrete slab. As an outcome of the graph, we can see that as the size of the shear connectors increase, we get smaller end slabs. Similarly, we can see that models with steel dowels and WWSS had the minimum end slabs, followed by models with steel dowels only, and finally, models with WWSS only. Finally, it was found that all the models had less than 2 mm end slab at failure, which illustrated a brutal failure of the shear connectors. However, the very small end slabs at failure was attributed to the small magnitude of longitudinal shear caused by bending and the amount of shear connector used in the models, which reduced even more the amount of shear forces carried by each shear connectors and did not allow the shear connectors to reach their slip capacities before reaching the flexural failure of the slab. Finally, let's have a 3D visualization of slabs deflections and failure mechanisms of the slabs which were greatly affected by the location of the load pressure on the slabs. For models with loads applied mainly on steel beams, the deflection curvature was only in the longitudinal direction as seen here. Pure flexural failure was noticed for these models that start with horizontal line cracks and concrete rubs below the loading locations and continue to grow and increase with increased deflections until reaching the sides of the slabs until failure. On the other hand, models with loads applied mainly on concrete had different behavior. They had concaved deflections in both longitudinal and transverse directions, especially in the area between the loading points. In these models, small horizontal cracks begin in concrete below the loading points that continue to grow and develop in longitudinal and diagonal directions causing flexural failure with yield line pattern. As an additional observation, models with steel dowels and larger shear connectors had less and smaller number of cracks compared to models with WWSS only and smaller shear connectors respectively. To summarize the conclusions of this research, first, the location of the applied loads on posts had a significant contribution to their performance. Second, the use of horizontal steel dowels shear connections in posts provided higher moment resistance in comparison to WWSS only. Third, the addition of WWSS to steel dowels showed no improvement in the performance. Finally, the small magnitude of longitudinal shear and bending and the use of large number of shear connectors resulted in a brutal behavior of failure for the post units in bending. Here are some of the references used in this paper. Thank you for attending this presentation and now the floor is open for your questions.